I'm going to try something a little different with this video, which is to read an excerpt from a book to accompany some footage of tree felling and processing I did with an axe and bow saw this past November. This excerpt is a short essay called Axe in Hand by Aldo Leopold. It's a chapter from a book called The Sand County Almanac that was published in 1949, a year after Leopold's death. Aldo Leopold is a famous author and early founding influence on the modern practice and philosophy of forestry and wildlife management in North America. He worked for the U.S. Forest Service and later was a professor at the University of Wisconsin and then went on to chair the first university department of wildlife management. He has a lot to say about stewardship, and developing and enjoying a relationship to the land and to the ecological community of plants and animals that also live in a place. Axe in Hand by Aldo Leopold The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but he is no longer the only one to do so. When some remote ancestor of ours invented the shovel, he became a giver. He could plant a tree. And when the axe was invented, he became a taker. He could chop it down. Whoever owns land has thus assumed, whether he knows it or not, the divine functions of creating and destroying plants. Other ancestors, less remote, have since invented other tools. But each of these, upon close scrutiny, proves to be either an elaboration of or an accessory to the original pair of basic implements. We classify ourselves into vocations, each of which either wields some particular tool, or sells it, or repairs it, or sharpens it, or dispenses advice on how to do so. By such division of labors, we avoid responsibility for the misuse of any tool save our own. But there is one vocation, philosophy, which knows that all men, by what they think and about what they wish for, in effect wield all tools. It knows that men thus determine, by their manner of thinking and wishing, whether it is worth it to wield any. November is, for many reasons, the month for the axe. It is warm enough to grind an axe without freezing, but cold enough to fell a tree in comfort. The leaves are off the hardwood so that one can see just how the branches intertwine and what growth occurred last summer. Without this clear view of treetops, one cannot be sure which tree, if any, needs felling for the good of the land. I read many definitions of what is a conservationist and written not a few myself, but I suspect that the best one is written not with a pen, but with an axe. It is a matter of what a man thinks about while chopping, or while deciding what to chop. A conservationist is one who is humbly aware that with each stroke he is writing a signature on the face of his land. Signatures, of course, differ, whether written with an axe or a pen, and this is as it should be. I find it disconcerting to analyze ex post facto the reasons behind my own axe and hand decisions. I find, first of all, that not all trees are created free and equal. Where a white pine and a red birch are crowding each other, I have an a priori bias. I always cut the birch to favor the pine. Why? Well, first of all, I planted the pine with my shovel, whereas the birch crawled in under the fence and planted itself. My bias is thus, to some extent, paternal. But this cannot be the whole story, for if the pine were a natural ceiling like the birch, I would value it even more. So I must dig deeper for the logic, if any, behind my bias.
The birch is an abundant tree in my township and becoming more so, whereas the pine is scarce and becoming scarcer. Perhaps my bias is for the underdog. But what would I do if my farm were further north, where pine is abundant and red birch is scarce? I confess I don't know. My farm is here. The pine will live for a century, the birch for half that. Do I fear that my signature will fade? My neighbors have planted no pines, but all have many birches. Am I snobbish about having a woodlot of distinction? The pine stays green all winter. The birch punches the clock in October. Do I favor the tree that, like myself, braves the winter wind? The pine will shelter a grouse, but the birch will feed him. Do I consider a bed more important than board? The pine will ultimately bring ten dollars a thousand. The birch, two dollars. Have I an eye on the bank? All of these possible reasons for my bias seem to carry some weight, but none of them carries very much. So I try again, and here perhaps is something. Under the pine will ultimately grow a trailing arbutus, an Indian pipe, a pyrola, or a twin flower. Whereas under the birch, a bottle gentian is about the best to be hoped for. In this pine, a pileated woodpecker will ultimately chisel out a nest. In the birch, a hairy will have to suffice. In this pine, the wind will sing for me in April, at which time the birch is only rattling naked twigs. These possible reasons for my bias carry weight, but why? Does the pine stimulate my imagination and hopes more deeply than the birch does? If so, is the difference in the trees or in me? The only conclusion I have ever reached is that I love all trees, but I am in love with pines. As I said, November is the month for the axe. And as in other love affairs, there is skill in the exercise of bias. If the birch stands south of the pine and is taller, it will shade the pine's leader in the spring and thus discourage the pine weevil from laying her eggs there. Birch competition is a minor affliction compared to this weevil, whose progeny kill the pine's leaders and thus deform the tree. It is interesting to meditate that this insect's preference for squatting in the sun determines not only its continuity as a species, but also the future figure of my pine and my own success as a wielder of axe and shovel. Again, if a droughty summer follows my removal of the birch's shade, the hotter soil may offset the lesser competition for water, and my pine may be none the better for my bias. Lastly, if the birch's limbs rub the pine's terminal buds during a wind, the pine will surely be deformed. The birch must either be removed, regardless of other considerations, or it must be pruned of limbs each winter to a height greater than the pine's prospective summer growth. Such are the pros and cons the wielder of the axe must foresee, compare and decide upon with the calm assurance that his biased will, on, that, on the average, prove to be something more than good intentions. The wielder of an axe has as many biases as there are species of trees on his farm. In the course of the years, he imputes to each species, from his responses to their beauty or utility and their responses to his labors for or against them, a series of attributes that constitute a character. I'm amazed to learn what diverse characters different men impute to one and the same tree. Thus to me the aspen is in good repute, because he glorifies October and he feeds my grouse in winter. But to some of my neighbors he is a mere weed, perhaps because he sprouted so vigorously in the stump lots their grandfathers were attempting to clear. I cannot sneer at this. For I find myself disliking the elms, whose re-sproutings threaten my pines. Again, the tamarack is, to me, favorite second only to white pine, perhaps because he is nearly extinct in my township, underdog bias, or because he sprinkles gold on October grouse, gunpowder bias, or because he sours the soil and enables it to grow the loveliest of our orchids, the showy lady slipper. 
On the other hand, foresters have excommunicated the tamarack because he grows too slowly to pay compound interest. In order to clinch this dispute, they also mention that he succumbs periodically to epizootics of sawfly. But this is 50 years hence for my tamaracks, so I shall let my grandson worry about it. Meanwhile, my tamaracks are growing so lustily that my spirits soar up with them skyward. To me, an ancient cottonwood is the greatest of trees, because in his youth he shaded the buffalo and wore a halo of pigeons. And I like a young cottonwood, because he may someday become ancient. But the farmer's wife, and hence the farmer, despises all cottonwoods, because in June the female trees clog up the screens with cotton. The modern dogma is comfort at any cost. I find my biases more numerous than those of my neighbors, because I have individual likings for many species that they lump under one dispersive category, brush. Thus I like the wahoo, partly because deer, rabbits, and mice are so avid to eat his square twigs and green bark, and partly because his cerise berries glow so warmly against November snow. I like the red dogwood because he feeds October robins, and the prickly ash because my woodcocks take their daily sun bath under the shelter of his thorns. I like hazel because his October purple feeds my eye, and because his November catkins feed my deer and grouse. I like the bittersweet because my father did, and because the deer on the 1st of July of each year begin suddenly to eat the new leaves, and I have learned to predict this event to my guests. I cannot dislike a plant that enables me, a mere professor, to blossom forth annually as a successful seer and prophet. It is evident that our biases are in part traditional. If your grandfather liked hickory nuts, you will like the hickory tree because your father told you to. If, on the other hand, your grandfather burned a log carrying poison ivy vine and recklessly stood in the smoke, you will dislike the species no matter what crimson glories it warms your eyes each fall. It is also evident that our plant biases reflect not only vocations, but avocations, with a delicate allocation of priority as between industry and indolence. The farmer who would rather hunt grouse than milk cows will not dislike hawthorn no matter if it does invade his pasture. The coon hunter will not dislike basswood, and I know of quail hunters who bear no grudge against ragweed despite their annual bouts with hay fever. Our biases are indeed a sensitive index to our affections, our tastes, our loyalties, our generosities, and our manner of wasting weekends. Be that as it may, I am content to waste mine in November with axe in hand.